massive container ship has been dislodged. Hello, my name is Marion Robson, and I'm with the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, North America. We are a leading organization in the fields of logistics and transport, and have members in more than 30 countries around the world. Our primary goal is education and professional development in these fields, and we organize events and webinars to further understanding of significant developments in domestic and international supply chains. One such event was the recent grounding of the mega container ship Ever Given in the Suez Canal, which resulted in a blockage of, more, of up to a week. With us to talk about this incident is Stephen Brown. Captain Brown uh, is a, an active marine consultant in Vancouver and has spent 21 years at sea, followed by progressively senior positions in shipping around the globe. Stephen was president and CEO of the BC Chamber of Shipping from 2008 to 2016. Stephen, could you please talk about the current challenges facing the container industry over the past year during the pandemic. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Marin. Uh, I don't think anybody predicted the challenges of 2020. Uh, once China came out of COVID, um, uh, there was a surge of exports to the developed world, uh, and that resulted in widespread port congestion, uh, an escalation of freight rates, shortages of containers, and consequent uh, serious disruption, actually, to supply chains. Um, uh, as million, millions of people uh, continue to work from home uh, and people are restricted from traveling, uh, it does appear that many have just simply turned to computers uh, and they're using the virtual shopping malls that are, that are available. And, and there's absolutely no sign that this is going to reverse itself in 2021. Could you please comment on the importance of the Suez Canal in the facilitation of international trade? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, since it opened uh, back in 1869, uh, Suez has been a remarkably reliable tra trade link uh, between Asia and Europe, but also uh, more recently between Asia and the United States East Coast. Uh, it's a very important source of revenue for Egypt, uh, at between five and a half and six billion dollars a year. Um, the number of daily transits speaks for itself. Um, there's around 50 to 55 ships a day, uh, representing between 10 and 15 percent of world trade using the canal. Uh, and that's spread over container vessels, tankers, LNG carriers, auto carriers, bulk carriers, naval vessels, and also a few cruise ships. Um, Suez has come under pressure with the expansion of the Panama Canal, uh, but also from fluctuating bunker prices, uh, which have resulted in deviations around the Cape of Good Hope. The Suez Canal Authority, SCA, has responded with a partial uh, expansion of the canal, a 35 kilometer twinning of the central section of the canal in 2014 uh, and 15 uh, in order to reduce transit times and has also offered a number of tariff incentives. What will be the process to investigate the grounding of the Ever Given and how might lessons learned be used to prevent a recurrence? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question and certainly um, there are many Monday morning quarterbacks uh, looking at this question at the moment. Um, and. Some of them are unfairly uh, speculating on the incident, I, I would suggest. But from a neutral standpoint, uh, you have to approach any investigation with the belief that the master crew and the pilots were playing the hand they were dealt at the time and professionally executing their jobs to the best of their abilities. Uh, inevitably, there has been uh, media reflection on the growth of ultra-large container ships over the past 10 years. Uh, the na there are now more than 130 uh, of that type of uh, container vessel, ranging from 18 to 24,000 TEU, mostly trading between Asia and Europe via Suez, 
But it must be said that ports and supply chains uh, have done really quite an amazing job in upgrading their infrastructure in, in order to meet the challenges that these, these vessels uh, pose. Uh, we also have to give collective credit to the economic efficiency or, and environmental gains that the, these vessels have provided. Um, the situation right now is that the Suez Canal Authority, SCA, is seeking an out-of-court settlement for a billion dollars to cover lost revenue and the costs associated with uh, refloating the Ever Given. Uh, and the SCA continues to hold the Ever Given as uh, leverage. The Japanese owners have filed suit for limitation of liability in the London High Court and have also declared general average, meaning that the uh, that meaning, meaning that every cargo owner will ultimately be asked to contribute towards the costs that have been incurred. A preliminary investigation is underway, but ultimately I believe there will need to be a more formal investigation. Uh, and it's complicated because there are many parties involved. Um, and I will list some of them for you, actually. Uh, the Suez Canal Authority itself is obviously uh, very involved. The Classification Society for the Ever Given, uh, the American Bureau of Shipping. The flag state for the Ever Given is Panama. You have the UK PNI Club, which is closely involved uh, as the insurer. Uh, you have a Japanese owner of the Ever, Ever Given through a Panamanian subsidiary. And of course, you have Evergreen themselves, which is Taiwanese. Uh, and you have a couple of ship managers involved. One is Japanese and one is German. Um, added to which, of course, you have an Indian master, officers and crew, and you have Smith Salvage, which is Dutch. So all of those entities will have uh, a very high interest in an, in, in an initial and ultimately final investigation, however long that takes. But I would have to say that in a marine investigation such as this, you can probably divide the gathering of information between generic and standard procedure, uh, and that which can be considered specific to this particular accident. So if you work your way through the generic procedures that would normally be followed, um, there will be an examination of the ship's black box. Uh, that is to say the voice recorder, course recorder, engine room log, etc. Uh, there will be an examination of the AIS tracking records. That's the automatic identification system for the vessel. Uh, statements will be collected from the pilots uh, and the vessel's master and crew records of recent pilot training and skill assessments, possibly also an examination of recent medical records. Uh, some jurisdictions will also routinely test for impairment after an accident. Uh, there will usually be consideration as to whether fatigue played any sort of a role in this incident. And as for Port State Control Records, it's a relatively new vessel. Uh, uh, it, was, it came into service in 2018, but there will be a Port State Control and probably those records will be examined for any deficiencies that have been registered. Um, specific to this particular investigation, I think that uh, I would suggest there may be uh, some consideration to what the bridge resource management exchanges were like prior to setting off from uh, from Suez uh, for the for the transit. Uh, did they discuss uh, the weather conditions, the forecast, uh, and give any consideration to uh, what might be involved in the transit? Uh, there will certainly be consideration to what those weather forecasts look like and also to the weather, the weather that was actually experienced during the course of the transit. Um, Ever Given herself was number five in the south to north convoy that day um, and she experienced a, a wind of around 30 knots it was reported on the port quarter um, and she did not have uh, uh, tug escorts at the time. <laughs> Um, she was also experiencing reduced visibility to a sandstorm. Um, another issue that will probably be looked at is the fact that there's a, a maximum speed of around 8 knots in the canal, but Ever Given was recorded as doing around 13 knots at the time of her grounding. Um, and they'll be looking to see whether this was necessary in order to maintain steerage in, in the prevailing high winds. Uh, an examination of the Suez Canal safety management system would likely be uh, considered. 
and also under what conditions are vessels required to take tug escorts perhaps in the canal and has this been subject to any form of risk assessment going forward um, I think also excuse me I think also if escort tugs are used um, an investigation would want to understand whether they would normally be tethered untethered whereabouts on the vessel they used on the bow and the stern um, and also what bar pull capacity these tugs actually can provide given the size of vessels um, it was also reported that two ultra large container vessels ahead of the ever given that is to say the costco galaxy uh, which is almost the same uh, dimensions as ever given and the al nazara uh, which is very slightly smaller both had tug escorts, so there may be an attempt to interview the master and pilots of those vessels. Uh, equally, uh, the container vessel Merced Denver was behind the Ever Given, um, and of course, in order to have a collective uh, understanding of what the conditions were like, um, any feedback from the pilots or the masters of those vessels would be very helpful to an investigation. Um, it was also reported that an LNG carrier that was due to transit with that same convoy actually took the decision to delay her transit, um, and, and that would be looked at. Um, another, another issue, I think, for an investigation team is that the maximum allowable length of a vessel that's currently allowed to transit sewers is 400 meters, unless there's special permission. Uh, the question that will be asked is whether this was established through the results of some form of risk assessment, and if so, what risks were identified, what consideration was given to mitigating those risks. And given that the canal uh, at surface level is about uh, 300 meters, and it, it does taper quite a bit uh, with depth. Therefore, they will also be looking at... Fourteen point five meters was that a mitigating factor and finally I would also speculate perhaps that there'll be a consideration to whether shallow water hydrodynamic hydrodynamics uh, and hydrodynamic bank effect may have played some role in the incident what are the practical issues to be considered before diverting ships via the Cape of Good Hope in sailing between Asia and Europe yeah, I'm glad you asked that. that. That's a bit close to home for, for me. Um, uh, in the late 60s, when I first went to sea, uh, I was on a tanker for the best part of a year, shuttling bunker fuel uh, down to South, Af South and West African ports uh, with the closure of Suez following the uh, Six-Day War between Israel and her neighbors. Um, I think that the consideration there is that uh, South Africa, the, the supply chain, the bunker supply chain feeding South Africa and West Africa uh, no longer exists. So if there were to be a sudden uh, major diversion of ships to the Cape route uh, between Europe and Asia, uh, that would be challenging for those ports to accommodate uh, because of bunker fuel supplies. For several years now, there's been a, a tight supply of bunkers in South African ports. And I would say even in the case of Singapore, which is the world's largest bunker port, uh, it will be struggling to cope with a major additional influx of ships looking for bunkers to get them to, to Europe. So uh, nobody should run away with uh, the thought that it's an easy overnight decision to use the Cape route rather than divert ships through Suez. Stephen, thank you so much for such an illuminating discussion about an important topic. It's my pleasure.